Good day, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you may be. This is Al's Geek Lab, and this is episode one of the Retro Reboot Show. Welcome along. Uh, I thought I'd just introduce you to uh, the idea. A while ago on um, the channel, I decided to um, make everybody aware of the fact that I was going to be doing one and ask me anything and I also did a poll to see if you guys were interested in me doing um, you know a bit of sort of retro news and other stuff which is topical to the Owls Geek Lab um, channel and for some reason uh, most of you said yeah absolutely we'd love some of that stuff so I kind of enjoy this stuff I think it's it's good it's kind of much more organic there's less production time so I can just riff off some stuff do a little video don't have to prepare too much but yet it's still relevant to the stuff that you are probably interested in if you watch channels like my one or um, you know the other ones that are around there that does retro stuff so for example if you like the 8-bit guy you like uh, LGR uh, you like um, oh god there's so many great channels out there if you like any of those sorts of things uh, retro recipes there you go um, if you like any of those sorts of channels, then the likelihood is you probably will like mine because it's the same sort of stuff. And I thought that I would just do some more topical stuff on top of that so you can basically ask me some questions, ask me for stuff that you would like to see on the channel, and, and if I think it fits, um, or I think I can do it justice, then I'll put it on um, this, this show. This is the Retro Reboot Show, and this is episode one. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. So hopefully it works out and uh, hopefully you enjoy what you see. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll run through what uh, what you can really get um, from the, ch the, the show just now. So basically, um, for all the information you need to know about the, the channel and the articles that I post up and all that sort of stuff, you can head over to my website, which is alsgeeklab.com. You can see it right here. And you can also get me on Twitter at alsgeeklab. You can get me on Instagram at alsgeeklab. You can get me on Facebook, Owls Geek Lab. Yeah, it's all Owls Geek Lab. You can get me everywhere, all the social media things. And of course, um, if you want to uh, donate to the channel to help me out, to um, help spurn me on and help me buy equipment and just generally make this uh, more of a full-time thing rather than um, doing my day job, which I do currently. And uh, not that I'm going to give up my day job anytime soon, um, but basically it gives me a bit more freedom to do this, a bit more justification. So if you want to help donate, you can head over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. And you can also go to Ko-Fi, ko-fi.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab over there. Ko-Fi, the idea with that one is just like a little donation thing. So you can just drop a couple of bucks to buy me a coffee rather than buy a sort of... Um, a, a, a proper donation subscription thing and you can also press the join button here on YouTube so if uh, you'd prefer to join on YouTube you can do that there so drink water need need the old water so anyway that's the website go to the website you can see all my stuff on there as well but obviously the channel is where all of the latest videos are posted so um a couple of weeks ago, maybe just less, I was on holiday. I've just got back. I'm still suffering a bit from jet lag, but I'm pretty much okay. It's It was summer over in the UK where I was, and over here in New Zealand, it's the middle of winter, and boy, am I feeling it. Like it, I've got the heater on, I've got the air conditioning out there, uh, pumping on full heat. Um, it's like five degrees out there. It's so cold, so I'm, 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 yeah, I'm just not ready for this, so my hands are keeping my... <laughs> It's on the heater whilst I do this video. But anyway, um, so whilst I was away on holiday, I thought this was a good idea to, to do a thing and ask me anything kind of thing. So I, I pops, posted a few things on Twitter and on on the uh, the, uh, the polls thing here on YouTube. And uh, I, I thank you very much for some of your suggestions. So um, I don't know whether to have to ask me anything in a separate thing or whether we would combine it in this this retro reboot show so for this one i think i'm going to uh combine the two and if there's any um any other stuff if i find that that makes it too long then maybe i'll swap off the ask me anything for another time in another place but uh, yeah if you if you go over to my patreon um uh you can specifically have an ask me anything on my patreon 
over there um, and it would be awesome uh, if you could because um, if you join Patreon there's a whole bunch of perks you get to see ex early access to all my videos and so forth and you get to do this sort of cool stuff so interact with me so um, yeah I don't think there was anything much that came out of my patrons um, but I will go over to um, the uh, the poll over here so, as I said, as a reader of Al's Geek Lab's posts, I'd like to give you the opportunity to send me questions in the comments to this post for upcoming Ask Me Anything video. Ideally, your questions are related to retro computing, infosec, linksy, force things, YouTube, blah, 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 but feel free to literally ask me anything. Um, so, um, some of you have done this. So, first of all, uh, the very first person, six days ago, who... Um, sent a message to me on this one and I'm going to completely make a mess of your name. I'm so, so sorry about that. Sam Salama, Sam Salama. Um, yeah, please, I accept my, accept my apologies for totally trashing your name. I, 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 I'm, I'm really bad with these things. So yeah, sorry, I can hardly speak English myself. So, um, so a good introductory topic, uh, says he or she, would be to uh, provide a summary of the systems in your collection and their corresponding peripherals and add-ons, including modern machines. Uh, so that is a great point, and I actually have done um, a few, like, like a while ago, it's probably overdue for another sort of update, um, but I, what I will do then is I think I will make another video at some point fairly soon, but... Um, there is a there was a video that I did for my patrons, which then I released publicly. So if you go onto my channel and look through the videos, you'll see like a. Um, in fact, I could probably bring it up here. That's probably um, that's probably a good thing, isn't it? Um, bring it up for all you guys uh, so you can find out what it's called. Um, yeah, there you go. Behind the scenes at Al's Geek Lab. So that basically showed off all the sort of things that I've got and it was a real rough and ready thing which I took like basically my mobile phone through the Geek Lab. Um, like I had, it all, I had my camera on the floor showing like old machines and just, yeah, just stuff. But all around me, you know, I've got I've got all sorts of machines. So I'm not going to list them all off right now because there's just too many to cover off. But I think I'll make a separate video where I go through everything. And one of my upcoming videos is going to be about, you know, the various machines. And one of them is going to be on my Osborne, um, which is uh, there's a there's a tie to the Osborne, particularly because um, the Osborne one is um, a, a separate video on all on its own. But yes, I have. Um, modern PC, modern machines. I've got a Raspberry Pi. I've got about four or five Raspberry Pis. I've got the Model B, the um, the second one that came out. I've got the Raspberry Pi four or something like that. So this is this this guy, this guy down here is yeah, like one of the more modern ones with the funny little mini mini HDMI things. Uh, this one is just. Here is a Linux box, really. This one's running um, Raspbian. And the point of that is to do little retro things with it, though. So there's a old IBM PC XT kind of thing just off, off camera over behind me, which you've seen in many of my videos if you watch the channel regularly. And you'll know all about that. Um, but what I do is sometimes I want to read my emails. Sometimes I want to do Unixy things. I want to basically do multitasking stuff at the command line and doing that stuff via DOS is, well, it's kind of difficult. So I will telnet into this little Raspberry Pi, which I've got telnet D running on, and I'll um, do stuff on there. Uh, so that's quite that's quite handy for that. So that's basically its main purpose. It's just a little telnet box on my network, um, which, I, um, which I do various retro things with. One of the things I actually do, um, there's a guy called Retro, Tre Retro Tech Chris. Uh, so if you haven't hit, had his channel, if you haven't checked it out yet, check that out. I'm gonna actually do a video on all of the subscriptions that I've got to Retro Channels. But Retro Tech Chris did a few great uh, videos. Um, one of them was a guide on how to, to set up um, Facebook Messenger via sort of Retro Pi uh, proxy sort of thing. So basically you could, um, from your DOS machine, your old retro PC, you could go into your IRC chat 
on there and connect to Facebook Messenger, which I thought was just wicked. So Chris has done a video on that one. Uh, you should definitely check that out. But having a little retro pie for that sort of stuff is just awesome because it kind of is a is a proxy. It's a it's a way to connect the the new world with the old world, and it's still you know you still feel like you're in a legitimate um, retro world. So using old kit to do new things, and and I use Facebook Messenger. I mean. Who doesn't, right? So, um, you know, the, being able to chat to people on Facebook Messenger on a DOS machine from the 1980s is just, just crazy. So I love that. So that's yeah. I've got Raspberry Pi. I've got like a, a fairly old, like a 2014, 2013 sort of PC. That is my main PC. That's what I'm recording this on right now. Um, so. So yeah, um, not uh, I don't really have a very flashy PC, but I, I actually bought it from uh, my old work. It's like a dual Xeon, so it's got it's it's pretty beefy, but it's like yeah, it's a good ten years plus old, maybe maybe older in fact. Um, it's got a yeah, it's got a dual Xeon, and it's got a reasonably like good for the time graphics card, an Nvidia GTX or something like that. I don't even know. Um, I'm terrible with modern hardware. Tell me about. I'll tell you about retro hardware all the time, but you know I just can't tell you about um, more modern stuff. It just doesn't interest me that much. It's got um, yeah, it's got a few uh, solid state drives which I've upgraded and I've put it in 32 gig of RAM. Um, so it's relatively well specced, I think. But really, I'm thinking it's getting close to about the time where I need to upgrade this box and and have something which doesn't creak as much because. When I render videos with the um, with the good old um, Premiere Pro, which is the main tool I use, it does does slow down quite a lot. Um, Mac, do I have a Mac? Yes, I do. I've got a MacBook Pro laptop from about 2014 over there. There's nothing special about that, but it goes with me on holiday and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I've got I've got the modern things. I've got the I've got loads of old machines. They're all kind of behind me, um, like the Apple II that you see there and um, I've got a Wi-Fi pineapple there for, you know, doing my security stuff just to, um, out of interest. They've got a Macintosh SE up there. There's loads of the things you can see in frame. Uh, there's For everything you can see in frame, there's like 10 other things that you can't. So, um, yeah, there's plenty, plenty of stuff kicking around here. Okay, so um, I will do a separate video on that question because I think it, it's definitely ju justifiable to do a, a separate video um, sometime soon. Um, Mika R says, how about a video series talking about older games and how they were programmed? Now, I thought about this one. I thought about answering that and I thought, well, actually, I don't know if I could justify that. I'm not, I'm definitely not a programmer. Um, I suck at coding. Like I, I did like C++ many, many years ago and I do a bit of PHP these days because I need to do something for web sometimes and the rest is just like written in bash and all of it is really bad programming so i'm not a programmer and so to talk about how uh, older video games were programmed uh, it's probably not best coming from me however keep watching this video mika because i have something about the game pitfall uh, coming up in just a bit, which is really interesting um, about the limitations of um, the Atari 2600 and how that console was actually um, came up with with um, with the possibility to make that game happen. So the console, the 2600 itself, came out in 1977 and it had 128 bytes bytes yes bytes of RAM. That's how much RAM it had. The whole thing. 128 bytes, that's like 1,024 bits, right? It's just nothing, absolutely nothing. And the ROM, so that was like on cartridge, that was a maximum of four kilobytes, right? So the storage space was incredibly limited. And obviously with ROM, you really can't do very much. That's what your program is, but you know, you can't write to it, read only memory, right? So very difficult uh, to program 255 rooms, which is what the original Pitfall game had uh, when it came out, I think it was like 1982, something like that. So to do a game of that size, that scale was just really, really very clever um, and with those sorts of limitations. So I've got a little bit coming up on that, not my Intel, uh, but I just want to show, show, share that with you right now. 
Um, or what do you think about digital zines or text files that were circulated on BBSs? Yes, 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 yes. I need to do a, a video on that thing because zines are like, look, we've got modern day uh, things, um, publications um, like um, Wired magazine. I guess Wired was originally a magazine and then it went online. And now we've got like, you know, different versions of that sort of a theme online. We've got loads and loads of websites which have, you know, tech journals and stuff like that. And they're great, fun, fantastic, love them. But back in the BBS days, we had these zines, which were like electronic magazines, but they were kind of underground in nature. And I loved them. I absolutely loved them. And they were on bulletin boards mainly. Um, and yeah, they kind of evolved onto the, the net and they became much more corporate in nature, I think. Zines still exist to this day, and it would be great to sort of maybe find some Zine examples and maybe do a separate video on that. So again, I think that's worthy of a separate video, um, and I could log into a few choice BBSs, show you the specific Zines which are on set BBSs, because um, these Zines aren't necessarily on all bulletin boards, they're just on some. So that's a really good point. I think that would be a great video on its own. Again, I don't want to spend uh, too much time talking about it right here. Um, but then, Mika, you came up with another question, which is kind of like just in a similar vein to what I was talking about, about, you know, the websites, you know, becoming a bit more corporate and so forth. Uh, you've talked there about the internet being too corporate. Most of the big sites, he, uh, Mika says, are almost unusable. That's, that's a big call. But uh, you're saying that they're almost unusable due to how bland and homogenous everything is becoming. I can't speak for everyone, but I feel like the BBS scene is one of only a handful of communities worth engaging with. Whoa, yes. Now, um, if you watching this video have watched my documentary series called Back to the BBS, um, I talk about this technology called bulletin board services, which were basically systems that were around kind of prior to the web and they were text mode. And look, for me and for the people who grew up with them, they were just super loads of fun. They're like, <laughs> like insane amounts of fun. And if you've never tried out a bulletin board system before, uh, watch my videos documentary series. I watched Jason Scott's <clears throat> documentary series as well. There's one kind of J Jason Scott's came out in like 2005. It was on DVD and stuff like that. And it was really about the history of what bulletin board systems were. My documentary series is about what bulletin boards are going forward to the 21st century because they still exist and they've been migrated onto the internet. So it'd be really cool if um, if you are if you are interested in, in in finding out more about that, have a look at one, one of those or Google what bulletin boards are and then get on to the bulletin boards and find the, the communities that are on there because there are communities on the message boards, on the chat uh, systems, on bulletin boards to this very day. I was on um, this morning on, um, a, a, it's called the meetup or the gravy train um, which is just like, you know, a bunch of people who are all interested in retro tech. We get on the bulletin board and we, we sit there in a chat room and talk away just about whatever stuff really interests us. And that was, that was really cool. And I think that um, the community spirit on the bulletin board system is something that is very special. It's like a totally different uh, community. It's not, doesn't feel like any community I've ever been involved with um on the the internet really i mean i've never felt that sort of level of closeness and um mika's not wrong i mean if you watch i think it's part three of back to the bbs that part talks about a bit about privacy and the corporateness of the internet versus you know the sort of wild west of the bulletin boards um so watch that uh, i think because that talks quite a lot to um, the homogenized version of the web that we have today. When the web started off, when the internet started off, we had things like Usenet and we had, you know, um, we had um, GeoCities and, and stuff like that. And people were very much open and creative. And I think the internet 1.0, the web 1.0, whatever you want to call it, was a very different place to what it is today. You know, in the sort of mid 2000s, People got uh, wise to making money on the internet and, you know, there were pathways to 
make it easier to make money and then people started finding you know ways to make money quickly and once once that all got you know uh, you know streamlined i guess um it became a much more corporate world and then social media came along and it was not long before you really open up your internet browser and you go to either google facebook you know twitter a few other websites that maybe run by microsoft but it's 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 run by you know the the stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis on the web you're probably hitting one of the sort of big four or big five companies right and that's really sad because you know back in the day there was no big five you would go all over the place and you'd hunt around for like cool out there links and you'd find sort of content on the internet which was quite difficult in itself like search engines like google didn't really exist um we had alta vista and then we had web directories like yahoo and stuff like that and uh, and then we had web rings um which is totally alien now to think about um but back in the day you basically had like yellow pages and 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 link shares things like that that just don't really exist today but it was a lot of fun and i think that that whole thing about the the early internet early web that's kind of gone now right we just don't have that anymore um and so now now we're kind of in this situation where um we have to um we have to to, to work differently if we go back to the bulletin board service the the bulletin boards of the 21st century are almost identical to the bulletin boards of the 20th century um there is no corporate shift or change so yeah it, it that i could talk all day about this particular topic and i think you're absolutely right mika the internet is getting too corporate well it's getting too corporate for me um in my own opinion you know and i you know i find myself doom scrolling on my mobile phone and going on instagram and facebook and twitter and all these things and i don't know if i'm getting any benefit out of it really i don't feel any better after i've done it but when i go on a bulletin board and talk to people it's like i'm talking to my friends and i'm you know immersed in a community and so forth so i think it's a very different feeling that you get when you go on bulletin boards and uh and i think it's very difficult to explain that in words you just have to go and do it and see it for yourself so if you haven't been on a bulletin board system absolutely get on a bbs go go visit uh, my my channel watch back to the bbs um and see what it's all about and then just go to the telnet bbs guide and find a bbs or check my one out you know that that's a good starting ground so um al's geek lab bbs uh, is is you know i don't want to say it's the best bbs in the world but it's definitely um not a bad place to start and it shares mrc chat which is one of the chat rooms that um is sort of shared amongst many you know good bbs's so go in there chat with all the other people who are on other bbs's as well and you'll find them a whole bunch of great people right so moving on uh 50 shades of beige asks me is what's your favorite retro peripheral oh wow um well that is a difficult one because um there are retro peripherals um that are true retro in the sense of they have been around uh, in the 1980s or the 70s or whatever. And then there are peripherals which have come out in the modern day, which allow us to do things with retro machines of past, right? And I love both of those things and kind of for different reasons, I guess. So uh, what do you do? Do you... Do you say, oh, I love like the Wi-Fi 232. I love that. I think that's just so good. The Wi-Fi 232, for example, is a thing that will pop into a serial port or an IO port of um, retro computers. They include like, I mean, the FujiNet one is a, is a really good example for the Atari 8-bit line of computers. But the Wi-Fi 232, general, general principle is you plug it into your serial port of an old computer. It could be a DOS computer. It could be an Atari. It could be a... Apple II could be a whole bunch of things. Lots of old computers accept these. And basically you can get on bulletin boards, you can get online um, using Wi-Fi. Um, so basically it just connects to your Wi-Fi router um, and then you know via the power of modern technology, 
you have a Wi-Fi signal that goes to your serial port and then you can connect to online services, which I think is just absolutely awesome. And the, the possibilities that that opens up to a machine, which is pretty much an offline machine, it was never intended to go on the internet, that that is a huge advance. I think that's a brilliant technology. Um, Favorite older sort of retro peripheral? Oh goodness, there are there are a lot. Um, I think one of the cooler ones, which I want to do a video on sometime soon. I need to get all the software and all the manuals. Uh, is the Microsoft uh, Soft Card, the Z80 Soft Card? I've got I've got one in my um, cupboard, uh, which I need to look out. For but it's for the Apple II. Now I found this out really recently, like as in the last sort of two weeks, that Microsoft were actually the biggest vendor of DR, Digital Research's um, CPM operating system in the sort of late 1970s and early 1980s. They were the biggest Z80 system reseller. So they sold D, um, Digital Research's CPM operating system, which by the time the PC rolled along was a competitor to MS-DOS. So that's that's crazy that Microsoft were actually the biggest reseller of DR CPM. That that's what that's wild, right? Because that was basically the that was the prevalent operating system at the time. And the reason that that was the case, uh, pretty much, was because Microsoft made these hardware cards, these expansion cards for Apple II machines and other machines, I, I think, but um, very popular in the Apple II, that basically allowed you to plug into your one of your expansion slots on your Apple II, and then it would give you a Z80 coprocessor. And with the Z80 coprocessor, that was the most common CPU for the uh, CPM operating system. So then you could operate uh, products which were written for CPM, such as VisiCalc and all the original DR, uh, not DR DOS, uh, CPM programs that came out. So all of a sudden you had, you know, products that were made for other machines um, for the most popular um, operating system at the time. And you could run them right on your Apple II through this sort of Z80 daughter board. Um, so Microsoft would package not only the card itself with the Z80 processor on it for the 6502 based Apple II, but also the CPM operating system. Uh, they would resell that as a, as a single package. Um, that's mental. Mental to think that they were reselling and they're the biggest reseller of the competitor's operating system. Um, and this is in a time when Microsoft, I guess, were most famous for, for making Microsoft basic on microcomputers. So really, really interesting uh, bit of Microsoft history and a bit of um, Apple history, really. Um, and famously went on, obviously, that um, Microsoft and um, digital research had a major falling out over um, the fact that, you know, depending on who you speak to, um, MS DOS was actually a ripped off version of the um, of CPM, and uh, if you look at MS DOS version one, you'll see why it looks just like CPM. That's a whole nother video I need to do as well. That that really is something on my list. Uh, I have a big list of videos I need to make, and that one is a that is a that's a major documentary style um, one that I really need to knuckle down on. I've actually bought some books recently um, and I've um, I've got interviews to make on that particular one. So that's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So great question. What's your favorite retro peripheral? There are a few. Uh, I love the CFFA uh, for the Apple II, which is more modern, allows you to, you know, read compact flashcards on your Apple II. Same with the, um, the equivalent on the, the IBM PC. Um, the next question was about next cloud and is it a good replacement for google one for average users um next cloud is awesome um i would i used to run next cloud and um what was the version of next cloud before next cloud i can't remember anyway um i used to run that myself um next cloud is great and it's got so many add-on plugins that you can use as well um it's great for people who know about open source software so if you um, are easy with, uh, you know your way around the Linux box, you're happy to set up and up maintain Nextcloud. It is great because it's like a Dropbox um, or a Google Drive replacement. 
um, which is fully open source and you can host it yourself. Um, and then you could obviously share that on the net and so forth. But you have to keep it up to date. You have to keep it secure. And so there's a bit of love that you need to put into it and ma manage it, especially if you're going to share it on the internet. Um, and it is relatively easy to use as a, as a sort of end user thing. Like mom and pop could use the, the web front end to it, absolutely no problem. But you do have to train them on the nuances, the differences of it. So yeah, I would say, look, any you know if you're, if you're okay with maintaining a Linux system, maintaining the security of it, putting the time and effort into maintaining it and updating it and giving it some love, then absolutely. Um, I maintained Nextcloud in a corporate environment with about you know 200 users. And uh, I think the some of the major version upgrades of Nextcloud were troublesome. They, there were some breaks that were silent, and then I didn't find out about the breaks until uh, users actually reported them and said, hey, this functionality that was in there has completely disappeared or it's broken in a bad way or something like that. So um, sometimes the upgrade processes were, were a bit difficult. I don't know if that's better now, but Nextcloud is, is a great product. Um, and definitely people, more people should know about Nextcloud because it's, it's, it's great. Um, <laughs> if you could have one deprecated feature from any piece of software back, what could it be? Oh man, look, I really need to think about that one. That's a really, really good question. Um, I think, you know, I've got lots, uh, there's probably lots of uh, answers I could give there if I really thought about it, but one that springs to mind just straight away is um, version incompatibility, like Microsoft Office. I'm going to, yeah, I'm looking at you, Microsoft. Um, like I have MS Word for DOS, and I love to sit over on my XT over there and type away, and I'll write scripts, I'll write stuff, because it is super to sit there at this old computer and just be in an environment where you don't have to have any pop-ups, notifications, other applications taking your attention away. I, I, you know, I must be a bit ADHD or something like that, but I love to just sit there and type. Nothing else, no distractions. And I can do that on that old XT in the MS-DOS, single tasking operating system. If I want Word, I get Word, there's nothing else. But then I wanna save that Word document. It's Word for DOS. I can't open it in Word for Windows. I can't even save it as Word for Windows format and open it in a modern version of Word. So Microsoft broke their backwards compatibility uh, with versions of Word. Um, you know, so if I run Microsoft Word for Windows 2, then I can open those documents. But really, that's impossible. So it's um, it's it's really, really uh, bad that Microsoft broke their own compatibility with their own document standards. I wish that you could still open legacy Word documents in a modern paid for version of Word. Um, same kind of applies to, you know, Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Excel and stuff like that. I wish they could they could just have backwards compatibility. How difficult would it have been to have kept that code in just so they could open, um, open the versions, even if they meant that it forced you to um, open them up and then convert them to the most recent docx because Microsoft evil, blah, blah, blah. That would be okay-ish. But what they're doing is they're basically saying, no, hey, if you're running some software that's so old, we're not going to even allow you to open them. And it's their own software. It's still called Word, which is which is a bit sad. Um, and then the last question is, what is your preferred CGA color palette? Well, not the default anyway, not the fuchsia. Um, it's the it's the yellowy reddy brown color one i think the you know it's, it's like it's a weird one and uh, a weird color um but you know the one i'm talking about right it's not the default one that people use the cyan white blue one not that one i hate that one um i like the the um the sort of lighter colors the the yellowy greeny browny one <laughs> i can't remember what the actual colors are but there you go um and there's a great thing about um CGA uh, in in uh, in in my next part of this video, which is over here. So I thought that I would carefully prepare some topics to discuss on this video, and this is where I think about the AMA. They ask me anything, and whether I should split up this section or not. Let's uh, let's crack on with this. Um, going into CGA. Uh, I wanted to, uh, that's that's a good place to start. Let me just talk about CGA. 
Now, um, I'm going to put the music down a bit. Do you remember the CGA demo yeah. called 8088 MPH? The team is now back with a new CGA demo called Area 5150. Where the old demo was created for an original IBM 5150 with CGA composite, this new demo uses the same machine but with CGA TTL output. You know, the 9-pin DB connector. So this video is from Retro Eric, but it's just his machine uh, playing back this demo by CRTC and Hornet. So it's a demo scene thing. And uh, what he just said there is he's talking about 8088 MPH, the demo that came out, oh, I don't know, a good few years ago now, it might have been like 2014, 2015, something like that, by Hornet and CRTC. Um, and that was just freaking awesome. And I've demonstrated that on my channel in a, in a few times. Um, just the other day, there was, um, a launch at um, the Evoke 2022, um, where the guys who made 808 MPH came along and made this demo. And this one is just sick. It's also got music from uh, Citrix. And Citrix is a guy who I interviewed on Back to the BBS, the one about mod music, tracker music, that sort of stuff. And I mean, like, the, the combination of the quality of the music that comes out of the PC speaker and um, the, the graphics and what they can do with CGA is just mental. So for those of you who don't know, CGA was the original color graphics adapter of the IBM PC, which came out in 1981. This card, the CGA adapter, could only do four colors on screen at any one time, right? And... Uh, it was it was crap and the resolution was low and of course the pc speaker was so limited it basically went on or off the you know the the sound was the worst like if you compared that to the sid chip in the commodore 64 the the quality of the pc speaker was just abysmal it just basically was there for a beep and what these guys have done is nothing short of a miracle so I'm going to This demo meets uh, 640 640 kilobytes of memory to run. Every effect except for one run at full 60 hertz frame rate. There is animation during the end credits. The music by both composers take full advantage of the speaker and engine limitations and overall everything flows good. No more talk. Enjoy. There's little Commander Keen. So that's the CGA four color palette, the one that I don't like, the uh, the cyan magenta one. And that's what it looks like, typically. Awful. So the guys here have done 16 colors, and then they, uh, they show that they can scale up the resolution. So it's pretty cool. Um, I won't. I won't show you the whole way through. I'm just gonna bring this volume down. I won't show you the whole way through this demo because I think you should go off and watch it yourself. And I'm pretty sure that um, the team will release a proper video of the full thing in all its glory sometime soon. But I believe that there are a few little last-minute changes they want to bring in and uh, show um, before they actually do that. So it's like this, this was the version that was released for the, um, for the 2022 Expo. And I think that there's gonna be a few minor tweaks to have the final result. So this is just awesome. Um, the link for this video is in the description. Have a look at it. Um, Jim Leonard is a legend and he's the guy who sort of pulled all of this together. Um, so yeah. 
just my hats off that you can do stuff like this with a card that was supposed to do four colors you can quite clearly see that's not four colors and the the quality of what they've got there is just nothing short of amazing i guess the more you know about the limitations of a pc at 4.77 megahertz and the the color palette um with cga really shows uh you know it's just a means that they can do this it's just absolutely amazing so go off and watch this video in its entirety if you think this sort of stuff's cool i absolutely think it's amazing all right so that's the first one there on my little list of things to talk about um a simple metadata cleaner for linux uh, appeared um i thought that was interesting uh so if you go over to um flat hub uh, you can pick out the GTK based metadata cleaner app, which is really cool because um, I don't know if you guys care or think about your metadata much, but if you take a photo with your uh, camera and you save it onto the internet somewhere, or if you save a Word document or you have an Excel spreadsheet or anything, all of these documents, photos, sounds, anything, They've all got metadata in them. And the metadata, depending on the application and what hardware you're using, can be very revealing about what what you what you are, what you're doing, where you are. You know, it can have GPS with coordinates in it when you take it with a, a smartphone, right? Anytime I use my Android phone, it's taking the GPS coordinates of exactly where I took it. And that information, if that photo go, goes onto the internet, it's being shared with everybody that can see that photo. So having the ability to strip all or parts of that metadata from your files, whether they're Word docs, spreadsheets, photos, music, whatever, PDFs, uh, that ability is really cool. And this, uh, this little app here uh, also lets you do it in bulk. So you could just select a whole shed ton of files and then just select all and then press delete and it will just clean the metadata right from them in one fell swoop. So that's a really cool thing to do. So uh, yeah, you can get that on FlatHub, um, flathub.org. Um, it's um, it's using the Mat2 library. So I thought that was really quite cool. So that's not retro news at all. That's bang up to date. But if you run Linux, um, that is um, sounds like a really cool application to to use so yeah uh, have a look at that um i was listening intently to my friend uh over at uh lunduk lunduk journal um and he had a an item on it about this thing called nscde or cde which was the common desktop environment back in the day uh, if you're aware of what that is basically uh, if you ran solaris or sunos or some of the early Unix environments, the first one of the first window manager environments was called CDE, the Common Desktop Environment. And what I think is really cool, and what what Lunduk obviously thinks is really cool, is the fact that NSCDE is a reboot of um, CDE, which looks almost the same. I mean, it's pretty wild. Um, it, you know, it looks very similar to. Um, to uh, the original CDE. Um, so you can actually download um, CDE and, and, and make yourself a modern compatible CDE environment. So if you liked CDE, have a look at this. It's pretty cool. And if you know what a CDE is and you want to relive your past CDE experience, head over to the um, the NSCDE GitHub page and you can download that there and, um, and or install one of the, the packages. It's really cool that that's around. Um, Doom skins. I'm seeing a lot of stuff at the moment for um, beautiful Doom and other versions of the Doom mods. Um, so here's like here's a here's a video of a few mods um, all combined into one, and this is using I think GZ Doom, and you can see they've got it in Terminator mode, and it's got extra jibs and gore and stuff like that. But um, I'm just just amazed at the moment just how much effort is going into um, modifying Doom again. Um, it, it's a never-ending story, of course. I mean, people are modifying Doom, but they what what beautiful Doom is doing. There's a beautiful Doom mod um, project, and you can see the the rain here and all the rest as well, the sound effects. 
what people are doing at the moment is really combining a whole lot of mods to make the original Doom experience even better. And, and you can see how high res uh, they're, they're doing. So they're upscaling, upscaling anti-aliasing, all that stuff. There's a whole bunch of really high quality work going on at the moment um, that you, you, you have to, you basically have to add on a whole bunch of mods to make this experience possible. But I'll have more about that in the description. But um, yeah, just really cool bunch of mods that are coming out for Doom right now, which is making the original Doom look awesome on a high res 4K display, you know, like this is perfectly viewable at 60 frames per second on a 4K display and just going, yeah, this is this is awesome. So yeah, really nice. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the, you know, the Doom 3 style thing, which is where they've got the the, the torch. I, I like a bit more brightness, but I just think that's cool that, that it's still happening. So yeah, look out for beautiful Doom, uh, which is all the shiny upscaled um, art. And there's this separate rain mod and so forth. I'll, I'll list them all in the description anyway. So there you go. That's um, that's beautiful Doom, etc., etc. Uh, what else? CPM. CPM is now open source. Yeah. Okay. So over here, uh, it uh, Retro Computing Forum. Um, the CPM was back in as far back as 2001 placed into somewhat of the public domain. So CPM, as I said earlier on, is the operating system that was kind of the king of the crop before MS-DOS. Um, it was back in the day, it came out in like the 70s, like yeah, sort of mid, mid, like 75, 76, something like that, right at the beginning of personal computing um, by Digital Research Incorporated, um, run by Gary Kildall. Um, so if you know anything about that, um, it was great that back in 2001 it became open source or at least um, public domain, but the license wasn't clearly defined and I think that made a few people or the majority of people still somewhat scared that they could legitimately use CPM. So fortunately, um, CPM, the, 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 the gentleman who sort of maintains ownership of CPM has come out and said, hey, no, it really is open source. Um, so the new license uh, shows, let this paragraph represent a right to use, distribute, modify, enhance, and otherwise make available in a non-exclusive manner CPM and its derivatives. This right comes from the company DRDOS Incorporates Purchase of Digital Research, the company and all its assets dating back to the mid-1990s, DRDOS Incorporated. I, Brian Sparks, president of DRDOS Incorporated as its representative, is the owner of CPM and the successor in the interest of digital research assets. So after many a procurement, I mean, if you think about it, because Novell purchased digital research, and then I think Santa Cruz organization were involved in there somewhere, and it just got horribly messy. It really did. Like, so there's lots of sort of big corporate companies that sounded quite scary and like if you use them or distributed DRDOS or um, CPM or anything like that then you could be sued or you know nasty things would happen to you that's all been clarified now and it's come out so that you can completely freely use the code of CPM and you can distribute CPM as far as you like it's all good so really great to hear that I think that's wonderful news because I think you might see a lot more pet projects on the retro scene which are using CPM now as a result of that news. So that's great. CPM, um, you know, was the it opened up a whole world for all these early microcomputers. So I think that's, that's going to be great for the retro computing um, scene in, in, in itself. Um, this one I thought was quite funny. Uh, this one is uh, a... Retro Pi, um, and uh, sorry, a Raspberry Pi Pico, which is the really, really basic um, Raspberry Pi. It's like really low power. And it's just showing basically this article shows uh, how well even this very low power um, Raspberry Pi can emulate a 6502 processor. Um, and what has been done by this gentleman here, he's basically um, emulated. Um, a, C a 6 6502 computer on his machine here and it's got the VGA output and all the rest um, so it's basically 
side by side with an Apple II, a real Apple II running with a 6502 processor. And you can see the performance is extremely capable. So, you know, this is, you know, effectively emulating the real deal, but, you know, performance wise, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And there's lots of benefits, obviously, of using a modern 6502 over an old 6502. You don't have the hardware fatigue and all the rest. So, you know, it's great that it's very close to the the original. Um, just love this sort of stuff that people are still doing these homebrew machines after all this time. That, that's just wonderful to see. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we talked about Pitfall earlier on, so very briefly. So let me go back to that one, Pitfall, here we go. Oh yes, this one. Um, so this is an article, I'm just gonna link to this, I'm not gonna read this out, um, but uh, this uh, 2600 game, uh, the, the first sort of rooms-based game with the Atari 2600 was called Adventure, which looks like this. And you can move, that's your character there, this block. Uh, literally, you are a block, a box. That's it. Um, but you, you, you know, you moved about these these dungeons, I guess. Um, and I think I think it was actually randomly generated or something like that. But basically, at Adventure, you know, you had multiple rooms in that game, and it was quite a feat, considering the fact that you had a machine there, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, which, as I said earlier, had a hundred and twenty eight bytes of RAM, one hundred twenty eight bytes, and at ROM at the time was only 4K, four kilobytes of ROM. So really not an awful lot. So then if you think about the size of the game Pitfall, which came out in 1982, still using that 128 bytes of RAM and, and the 4K of ROM, that was the hardware limitation. Um, it is just amazing that Pitfall came out uh, as good looking as it was. Because I mean, let's face it, Adventure, whilst it was interesting it was very basic uh, really really basic looking so to have pitfall with all its colorful graphics and sound its multi-level design it had 255 not 255 it's a special number in computing and programming terms uh, but it had 255 different screens different rooms with different challenges to, to have that amount of data stored if you think about it is pretty much impossible on the surface if you and i were coding it you know we to find to find a way to code it into uh you know 128 bytes of ram is you know pretty much uh impossible but it was done by a thing called procedural generation and uh, so i won't bore you uh with reading it all out i think if you're interested in this you should um read it yourself but basically using bits not bytes but bits of uh, memory you could toggle whether there was an, a particular item or a particular uh, bit of graphics in a uh, particular room, and then there was an algorithm to uh, that was generated um, to um, generate each room. It just just blows your mind the effort that they had to go to to make these sorts of things. So there, I will link that in the description for this video. Just um, really really cool that. Um, that's so this sort of demonstration of how the limitations of platforms were overcome with just very clever thinking. Um, just love that sort of stuff. And it's, it's great that this is all out. Um, also, I found on uh, on the article for that, that a version of Pitfall is being worked on currently, uh, that as of June 14th, 2022, it's, the project was started, but the version is, is being prepared for the BBC Micro. And I love the BBC Micro. So that's freaking cool, right? So you can see development in progress. Um, there's there's little YouTube videos of it and everything. So if you've got a BBC Micro and you fancy playing Pitfall, then um, yeah, you can read up on the star.org.uk forums. Um, and then the last thing I had on was, was was it the last thing? I think it's, it's getting there anyway. Oh yes, this one, because blinking lights, right? Everybody loves blinking lights. This guy here, again on the Retro Computing Forum, this guy um, has shown, uh, he acquired himself a 1959 IBM 1620 computer. And I mean, the beautiful thing about those machines is the toggle switches, the real tactile switches and all the blinking lights. And um, it just, you know, it just 
makes you go with computer lust. Um, so they, there's loads and loads of photos that the, the gentleman who's been doing this up has done and he's lovingly restored this and he's using a Arduino to power the whole thing. Now, if you think about how low power the Arduino is, it just you know gives you an example of just how little computing power these IBM machines or these machines of the 50s and 60s had you know, the Arduino was basically one of the lowest powered microcomputers of today, and it's still way more powerful than these uh, 1950s machines. So there it is in its glory. Um, basically, this gentleman, Owen Ferreris, Ferri Ferris, hopefully I pronounced it right, has um, lovingly crafted this machine back to somewhat of semblance of its original state and you can see it looking you know pretty swell with all its blinking lights there and it's you know um displays so he's gone through everything he bought it off ebay and and a lot of it was just in a complete state i mean uh there were switches that didn't exist and there was bulbs that just weren't there and you know all sorts of stuff and he went through this and you know spent an awful long time as you can see you know basically making lighting arrays and uh making a, an output on his Arduino to talk to all of this. And yeah, just amazing the amount of time that he spent making all of this happen. Um, and you can go through this uh, yourself, but it's just really, really cool. There's a bunch of Arduino boards there um, to go through. Yeah, so really cool, really, really awesome. And there it is sort of um, it, the finished article, really cool. Uh, the last one here I was going to show was um, so on a similar vein. This is a portable computer uh, from 1988. Now, I have a machine just like this, right? Um, as in the case is identical. It's a Sharp PC. It's made by Sharp. And it's not a 386 as this photo has. It's, this is a 386 um, LCD-based portable computer. I have a nine, uh, 19... It would probably be about 1988, but it was an 808 or an 8086 machine. So very interesting. It's in exactly the same form factor as this. It's a luggable machine, and I've got to do a video of that at some point. But you can see, yeah, very similar, um, even down to the five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive. It's not black, it's beige um, and all yellowed. But this gentleman basically took this machine apart, um, donated all of the, uh, the original retro machine parts to to somebody else and then gutted it and then put in a water-cooled um, ITX system with with a Ryzen CPU, all modern, and actually made a real machine out of it, which is just incredible. So yeah, it's a beast of a machine. It's really powerful um, in a tiny little 19.5 liter space. So it's like, yeah, it says here, 0.68 off cubic feet, just really good. But an NVIDIA RTX 3060, um, with an AMD Ryzen 5600 CPU, um, screen and a keyboard, all self-contained. Um, and he's obviously done it up with even like a, you know, a modern mechanical gamers keyboard and so forth. It's just wicked cool that he's um, completely hacked that into, into a box. That's on Hackaday if you're interested in seeing that article as well and seeing how he did it. But really cool. Um, so there you go. I think that's probably everything I had for today's um, retro show. Um, so if you've enjoyed this show, then let me know. And I also have um, a suggestion from somebody else, which was about doing an, uh, this day in 1980X. And so I wanna do that as well. Um, and I've got um, various things I can talk about. I'm gonna talk about the Osborne uh, computer, for example. So um, that will be coming up sometime very soon as well. Um, but let me know if you enjoyed this. This is kind of like a you know a, a, a trial. See what see what you think. And um, yeah, and if you liked it, we can do some more of this. If not, then well then you know try some things out. Some of them work, some of them don't. And that's just the way of it. So let me know what you think in the description. Um, obviously, I would super super appreciate if you gave this video a thumbs up, and I would also appreciate this subscription. And the reason for that 
is, well, one, you know, it makes me feel like I'm amazing, but the most important part is that it gets the message out to other people who are watching these sorts of videos. And, um, you know, if I can do anything to, you know, make these videos more popular and help the, the retro community overall, that would be a wonderful thing. So yeah, share share the love with everybody and, um, and it's all gonna be good. So don't forget as well, if you like the stuff that I do, head over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash AlexGeekLab, become part of the exclusive club. Or you can also check uh, me out here on YouTube, just press the join button and become a member here. Same sort of idea as Patreon, you become a little a donator. And um, yeah, you can you can join up and be part of the fun that way. So whichever way you want to, whichever way you want want to join in and participate, be be part of things. I really really appreciate um, your involvement in the channel. It, it makes it much more fun when when you know people are actually having a conversation as opposed to me just um, being involved and that's it. So yeah, really appreciate all of your support so far for all the Patreons as well and all of the people who have uh, given me feedback to the questions I've asked. Thank you so much. Um, keep them coming. I love to have all the feedback. Until next time, um, all the best and I'll speak to you later.